So hi everyone, as Dario said, uh, my name's Tim Green, I'm the Features Editor for the MEF, and um, I welcome you to the final session for today. Um, it's about business models. So uh, I've been in uh, mobile for quite a long time, and business models used to be very straightforward. You would just basically create a wallpaper, and you would uh, sell it using reverse build SMS, and the operators would take 40%. And um, sometimes it didn't work, but, you know, not many people complained. So everyone was happy. And uh, that goes back to kind of the early days of this business and the early days of the Mobile Ecosystem Forum, which then was the Mobile Entertainment Forum. Um, but, of course, now it's much more complex. We live in different times. And uh, we live in an app economy and uh, largely an ad-funded economy. So um, we have different challenges, but fortunately we also have a lot more opportunities. So to discuss those, I'm joined by... Gary from Syntonic, by Amir from Amazon, Jack from Wikimedia, Pierre-Francois from um, Orange, and Damien from Boku. So um, first of all, let's sort of start with big picture. Gary, maybe you can kick us off. What's wrong with a lot of the business models, you know, the dominant sort of ad-funded business model that we have today? Well, um, hello. Uh, I don't know if it's wrong, but I think the, the world's changing, and, and it's changing in, in real time. And uh, I think what we're seeing is the emergence of some sustainable new business models. Um, mobile advertising, of course, uh, content monetization, and, uh, and mobile commerce. And when you, when you add this up, this really is a, the new app economy that is about two and a half trillion dollars. And to date, mobile carriers have not really participated in, it, in, in any meaningful or substantial way. And so I think the challenge right now is for how does carriers participate? How do they, they change their business models uh, to actually capture a lot of this opportunity that has been built on their networks, their 4G networks? And uh, you know, there's a lot of hope around 5G, but some unproven business models there. So I think these sustainable, unproven models are going to be around for a while. So um, why, do you think, why do you think that operators have lost out so, ba so badly in this, in this new era, of, uh, in the current era that we're in? Um, Damien, maybe you can take that one. Thank you. Um, just uh, full, full disclosure, I uh, used to work at T-Mobile, UK, EE, uh, Deutsche Telekom Group as well. So although I'm not an operator anymore, I guess I still can sometimes recall that way of thinking. Um, I think from my perspective, uh, there's probably a couple of things really that, um, that, that really kind of laid the foundations for the problems. I think the first one, I'll give you an example. I mean, going back to 2007, 2008, we were working, uh, T-Mobile UK, working on an interconnect product, um, sorry, project about um, uh, a messaging product. We turned up to the meetings with the other carriers, um, and quite frankly, nothing of any importance was said because no one wanted to share any information. We're all too scared to talk to each other. I think actually that's changed a little bit now. With some of the stuff that people are doing, um, some of the, the projects I've seen, um, carriers are working together in a much better way. I think it's because of what's happened in between then and now, and that's the over-the-top players are coming into the market, they're kind of eating the dog food of the carriers. Um, and carriers have got together and begun to realize, well, actually, you know, there's uh, the stuff that we need to be doing together because we're not each other's enemies anymore. We're working together against other industries. For example, the financial industry, the advertising industry, carriers work as a collective much better now. Um, they've kind of cottoned on to those ideas. Not everyone, but a lot of them have. Uh, and I think they're catching up quite quickly. And I think, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, again, with my old carrier hat on, that's going to be something that we see more of um, as we go forward. But yeah, ultimately, I think we were too scared to work together. We missed out on a lot of the opportunities where the over-the-top players came in and basically kind of took all of that traffic, took all of those, um, those properties that perhaps, you know, the carriers, if they'd have worked slightly differently back then, um, would have been able to own um, and still monetize today. So direct carrier billing is one way of, for operators to get back in the game. Um, We've been talking about that for many years now. What, what do you think the state of that is at the moment? Obviously, that's the business that you're in. Uh, I think, I think there's, there's probably two, two or three different kind of models. The first model is the, uh, the app stores, for example. Um, Google, Apple, uh, they'll bring in you know, developers. They'll bring in their own products. They'll go to a carrier. Um, they will say one price, one tax model. 
Um, this is the way that we settle, et cetera, et cetera. Google the same. Then there's everybody else who do things slightly differently, and that's, that's the problem. It's the, the, the lack of ubiquity across markets, the lack of ubiquity across um, carriers within markets, across different regulations, across different um, you know, areas and, and uh, geographical, you know, uh, for example, withholding tax in certain markets, et cetera, et cetera. I think one of the biggest barriers at the moment is the fact that you know, we have all of these different rules and regulations to, you know, we really can't, I guess, supercharge um, the launch there. And that's something that we're both trying to, you know, trying to solve, trying to work out, and we can, you know, talk about that offline later. But I think that's probably one of the key things is the fragmentation of the marketplace there outside the, the big app stores. Um, you know, the, uh, I, I, I suppose the other thing is the cost of payments. You know, when you're a carrier and you're used to having, you know, you know, margins at 60, 50 percent, and you look at a margin of carry billing at 10 percent, you're thinking that's, you know, really quite tight. If you're a, a merchant and you're used to cards being at 1 and 2 percent, you know, you're thinking that's very, very high. So there's still the, a lot of work to be done um, on those margins as well. Um, bigger scale, um, you know, lower, sorry, lower volume, sorry, bigger volumes, bigger scale, lower margins, I think, you know, is the payment mantra. That's not necessarily the way that telcos work. Um, Amir, maybe I can come to you. So um, Amazon um, on mobile, you, you have um, uh, your, your app store um, and, um, and various other um, initiatives. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your approach to how you monetize content um, on mobile from an Amazon point of view. Yes, for sure. Um, with the Amazon app store, for those that uh, aren't too familiar, similar to kind of Google Play as well as iOS, uh, it exists on Amazon devices like Fire tablets as well as Fire TV. And there's two really big uh, routes for that uh, in terms of monetization. Uh, first off, uh, looking at kind of the bit of the traditional model that y you mentioned where 30% of the revenue is going to the App Store itself for all in-app purchases uh, or transactions. But in addition to that, we're also seeing a lot of new apps come into the space with a subscription model. Uh, so we're really going beyond. And one of the things we look at when looking at monetization is how do we tie the monetary value that the customer is paying to give it back to the customer in ways we delight them. And one of the things to, to do that that we've, that we've tried and tested with a lot of you know, apps as well as game developers to help them monetize, thus kind of monetizing our own store, um, is this concept of giving uh, rewards to customers as they deeply engage inside of the apps and games. So if you take a subscription as an example, when someone goes and needs to subscribe uh, to a specific uh, provider to get access to content, um, what uh, traditionally they've done is they tell a customer, hey, here's a free trial for seven days, 14 days, or so on, and then they have to kind of pay on an ongoing basis. And one of the new things we kind of introduce and we work with these app developers on is making it a bit more exper experiential for the customer. So for example, if you join and subscribe and watch 10 episodes of you know, a popular show, uh, then you get $10 to spend on Amazon or you get a free t-shirt that's related to the actual show. So really tying in both of these experiences to help the app developer monetize on one side, to help delight the customer on the other side. And then if that flywheel goes on and happens, then if Amazon and the Amazon App Store will kind of uh, monetize from there. And so uh, and Amazon's part in that is the sort of fulfillment side of it? or Correct. So uh, uh, one side is kind of the Amazon App Store, but one of the services that we provide and actually launched a couple of weeks ago called Amazon Moments, what it enables is this fulfillment aspect where any developer or any business really can come through and reward its customers for high value actions that matter to them as well as kind of their business. Uh, I gave the episode 10 as an example before. Uh, and for that, the, what's important is to figure out this action. Is it episode 10? Is it episode 5 or 20? Uh, and if a specific studio or an app knows that when customers reach episode 10, they're going to fall in love with the show and kind of continue engaging and continue watching, continue subscribing and so on, that's kind of where it comes in. And Amazon, uh, with its uh, fulfillment network and kind of the retail side and selection, really offers the, the fulfillment as well as the selection of rewards 
uh, that the partners partners can have uh, not only on the Amazon App Store, it kind of can do it on websites, on Google Play, iOS, as well as others as well. So, Gary, if I can come back to you, um, the this idea of uh, the idea that you're pioneering is, is sponsored content, um, sponsored data, um, which obviously is a pretty different kind of idea. Um, it puts operators back in the game of, of um, monetizing rich media content, which obviously everybody is, is, getting, is coming to expect on phones now with Netflix, etc. Tell us a little bit more about how this works. Sure. I think it's a, it's a little variation of the theme on what mm -hmm. Amazon is doing, except targeted more for, for carriers. Um, what's unique about this is it's about encouraging engagement, right? As opposed to you know, standard types of uh, mobile advertising, which is about acquisition, what's really unique is you know, we want to we control or own the customer throughout the entire journey, uh, not just the beginning, but get him to that buy button and continue to hit the buy button. Um, in, in terms of, of retention. Uh, what Syntonic does is we enable a service for carriers where we use data as an incentivization or as a reward. And it extends not just to um, digital goods, but even as an example, we're working with a utility company in South Africa that wants to reward its customers or, uh, who pay their bills on time for three months or in a row, you will get some sort of incentive in terms of data for your phone. And, you know, and, and phone first you know, geographies, Using data uh, you know, is, is, a, is a great incentive. It's a great way of engaging with your customer and getting them to, to monetization. And is that um, particularly applicable in developing markets because of the income levels and the cost of data? It, it helps. You know, there are, there are things. I mean, mobile advertising is a broad topic, and it works yeah. in, in all economies. Uh, our particular focus is more on the emerging. Latin America, South Africa, excuse me, Africa, and Southeast Asia, where uh, data tends to be a little bit more expensive, uh, and data acts as a barrier for people to actually engage. So, in, in some respects, that is a sweet spot for for us, but not necessarily, you know, in general. I think it can also work um, when you're targeting segments as well, um, specifically drilling down into specific segments. I don't know if many of you remember. Um, there's a company in the UK uh, which we worked with at E called Blick. Um, and they were very, very strict about the segments that they would target, and it would be students only. Um, they went, went very, very deep into the, the information that this, those that, that, that age group had. Um, ultimately, um, they just didn't have enough of a base. Uh, but actually, the model was cracked. I think the, in this day and age, I think it could work, as long as the, the base is big enough. So we've touched on developing markets there. So Jack, I'd like to bring you in now um, because Wikimedia is obviously a global organization, but it's very strong in developing markets. And you have a donation model, but you know, I just wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit about how you get your content out there, um, yep. what, what models you can use to subsidize it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Wikipedia is huge in Japan. It's huge in Germany. Um, but uh, Wikipedia is um, not as big, for example, in uh, Nigeria or Egypt or Iraq. Uh, the awareness of Wikipedia is not that big. And so the um, partnerships that we work on at the Wikimedia Foundation uh, are partnerships to increase this awareness, uh, increase the access, increase the uh, usage of Wikipedia. Um, and so we realized that with this low awareness, it's really important to find ways where we could describe uh, or explain Wikipedia in a way where people locally can understand that. So we worked on uh, partnerships uh, with local communities to try to explain what Wikipedia is. Uh, we saw that video uh, campaigns were a very, very effective, effective way to drive up the, the awareness. Uh, but I think one important way to view this um, is through a collaborative model. Uh, Wikipedia is an, is an open source, free knowledge encyclopedia. And uh, the, the mission behind Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Foundation is to provide this information free of charge for everyone to use, but also for everyone to contribute, to contribute their knowledge in their native tongues. Um, and so we see some of the challenges in, in the uh, communities or the countries that I work in in the Middle East and Africa is this lack of relevant content that's on there. And so by working on partnerships to try to grow the local communities and grow the languages on Wikipedia, we see this as a potential way where this is going to start affecting people in a much positive way in their lives. 
And so the donation model has been serving us quite well for, for quite some time. As you know, Wikipedia is a very transparent uh, donation model. And so by working with um, the mobile industry or the mobile ecosystem through operators, we found that there's ways where we can maybe take the commercialization element a little bit to the side. So if we work with mobile operators um, to help grow uh, digital literacy, um, there's ways where we can work together on creating toolkits so that people on the ground are able to start learning about Wikipedia, start learning in their native tongue how to search for information. And this gradual collaboration is, is, is forming more positive understanding of the way that we function uh, in the places that we, we work. So give, give us an example of, um, of how that works. Yeah, so we've uh, we worked with the GSMA on something called the MIST, the Mobile Internet Skills Training Toolkit. And with that, uh, we work with um, mobile operators, Tigo uh, uh, Rwanda, for example, where the actual operators train their salespeople to go train people on the ground. And we saw this as a very effective uh, way of doing it. We uh, trained over 250,000 people in Rwanda by using 300 salespeople that use this training module uh, to train people about using Wikipedia. Um, and we're rolling this out in other places as well. And so this is just one example of, of ways where um, understanding digital literacy as a challenge and finding ways where we can work around that. But I think the mobile um, model can be used in different ways. There's uh, other ways where Wikipedia can be shared with people. There's uh, SMS models. People seem to forget. We're, we're uh, here in 2019 at the Mobile World Congress and we're talking 5G and people seem to forget that, that SMS and USSD is still widely used uh, and it's still something that's out there. And so uh, finding ways where we can incorporate Wikipedia via text and send it to people on feature phones is, an, is another model. Okay, so, so we talked about operators there, and we have an operator with us here, Pierre Francois. So um, obviously operators, um, we, we've talked about how uh, they've, to a certain extent, missed the opportunity to monetize content, although they're clawing that back now. But clearly they have a lot of data on customers, and this can be used in, um, it, it, it sounds um, very commercial to talk about monetizing people's data, but there are, very useful ways of doing that, one of which is identity. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how mobile operators can use their data to yeah. help third parties with that. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. So uh, Orange, like a lot of other operators, we are not in the uh, business of selling data like uh, over-the-top players uh, whose business model is really uh, uh, about this. So you, know, you get a free service and uh, for the free service, uh, your data can be used. Orange and mobile operators are more in a um, different approach, which is uh, simplifying and securing uh, transactions online uh, by uh, using customers' data to avoid fraud. Uh, in fact, this has been the case for many years with things like SM OTP by SMS, SMS OTP for uh, payments, uh, for example. And um, a, a lot of operators have joined the Mobile Connect initiative uh, launched by the GSMA uh, a few years ago. We have already uh, five or six markets which are commercially uh, available and uh, which are now uh, a clear success. And uh, we are partnering with big players to move forward in that space, both for securing transactions, but also to uh, simplifying online processes like uh, um, auto-filling of forms uh, because we have a lot of data that the customer uh, uh, could uh, like to uh, hand over to the service provider instead of typing it again on the mobile phone which is sometimes a bit painful. Or we uh, have other security mechanisms such as a location check for example if you're uh, making a payment in the US uh, sometimes I'm a bit uh, surprised that uh, I don't have to enter a PIN code, I just need a signature. So uh, if my bank is able to check that I'm in the US with my uh, mobile phone at the yeah. time I'm making this payment, maybe there is some kind of reassurance behind that, so banks are interested by this service, yeah. and so am I. And Damien, digital identity is something that Boku is moving into, which is kind of like a reverse of taking money away, from, you know, taking 
taking money from people's accounts. It's sort of like a flip side of that. Maybe you'd explain a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very um, new thing for us at Boku. Um, we've just acquired a company called Denial um, Identity. I'm sure we're probably working together at some point, with, uh, yeah, in the, or if not now. But, um, <laughs> but essentially, um, yeah, so it's a reverse kind of chain. So carrier billing, um, customer pays, the carrier pays us, we pay the merchant. This is using the carrier's data uh, to authenticate, verify customers, um, you know, when they're making you know, charges in, in a bank or digital retailers or something like that, just to verify that they are who they say they are. They're, you know, using, utilizing a lot of the stuff that you've just been talking about up here. Um, but then the, the money flows back. So the bank um, is the customer, but they pay the carrier through us. So absolutely, it's a, it's a reverse of that kind of chain. But essentially, um, it's another way um, of utilizing money that you know, back in the 20, 30 years ago, carriers never ever thought that they would be doing that sort of thing, you know. Um, the one thing I found quite interesting, though, is um, still kind of thinking around this in my head, but, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, I've seen a lot around today about 5G, um, and I've seen some stuff that's kind of saying, I think there's something like 7 billion sims uh, in the market at the moment, um, but within the next five years or so, there's going to be something like 30 billion sims when 5G kind of really gets out there. Um, IoT... Um, machine to machine really kind of takes place and I guess I'm thinking a lot of that stuff still got to be automated as well sorry verified and and checked and authenticated so there's a huge opportunity one way or another I haven't got to the detail but one way or another there's a huge opportunity for carriers to really stake that claim there I think um, with all of those sims that are going to be yeah. coming up in the future um. So Amir talked about um, some sort of cross, crossover between offline and online content. Um, and Pierre Francois, I'd like to come back from you here because um, we're, there's a big push towards RCS and um, rich, rich data and messaging. Um, how, can, uh, how can that bring um, operators uh, and the rest of the mobile ecosystem sort of closer to the real world? I believe you've done some work on parking systems and things like that. Yeah, so the, the nice thing between RCS is that um, in a way it brings us back to the early stage of the internet because everything sits in the cloud. So um, you don't need to download an app to take care of managing the uh, heterogeneity of uh, I don't know how many Android version uh, in the space. So everything can run on the cloud with, uh, and you don't need also to, uh, for the customer to download the app an app that he will forget maybe a few days after and that will sit somewhere on his smartphone and that will be deleted one time. So with just one single app or one single entry point, uh, you, you may manage an interaction with customers which is nearly as convenient, if not more convenient than what you have with an app. I believe that uh, in a very near future it will be uh, probably uh, even better than, uh, than, with, uh, than with an app. And there are several business models for everybody behind that. So I think that both for the consumer and for the brand, uh, the relationship is easier. Um, for, the, for the telcos uh, who sit in the middle with Google, Samsung, and the rest of the ecosystem, uh, there will be several uh, business models. The first one is the, the right for the brand to access to the customers. Of course, the, uh, there is a price to pay for that because you don't want, at the end of the day, the customer to have 100 notification on his because that will kill the channel. And that's basically what uh, led the SMS uh, landscape to uh, keep this kind of model and to be a, a channel which is still secure and used. So this is topic number one, basically migration of SMS A2P to RCS A2P on the same economical basis. Then, uh, of course, there will be a kind of search or audience model, the, the ability to get to be visible, and so that customers can contact your brands because uh, you're visible uh, on, in different touch points. And uh, last but not least, as uh, RCS and Mobile Connect, which I mentioned, both rely on the uh, on the mobile phone, there are very simple ways to. Uh, secure transactions online or to uh, open ways to new payment mechanisms. So old ones like DCB, but uh, 
I think that uh, with a PSD2 in Europe, there are new opportunities as well for operators or other players to get into that space. So the big idea around um, RCS is that it could displace a lot of apps and it could become a place for brands to talk to their customers. Um, Amir, maybe I can ask you, what, what's, your, what's the Amazon thinking about how um, rich me messaging might lead to a new, new ways of, of talking to customers? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the big thing to start off is really when RCS gets to that stage where it has uh, considerable adoption, that's when it kind of really starts to matter. Um, and then the, when I think of it from a commerce experience standpoint, today with existing messaging channels or just kind of conversational uh, commerce, it, uh, it exists, but I don't think customers are used to coming and kind of paying for something yet uh, through a conversation, especially with bots, uh, where you, it's, a, it's a different kind of experience. And we've seen it when it's humans behind the scenes having real conversations, are able to support customers. Let's say if a customer wants to purchase something, there's back and forth Q&A and kind of very deep insights that the customer gets back. Um, that's where we've really seen it make a difference uh, versus with kind of a few uh, bots that are standard. So the technology really needs to advance for it to happen at scale. Uh, beyond just kind of chat-based conversations, we've also seen it more of the voice-based conversations with things like Alexa, uh, yeah. as an example, uh, where commerce is a major scenario of those. And uh, all of these new kind of platforms are brand new. Right? So there's a lot of experimentation that will happen. But from kind of an Amazon perspective, any new channel is a channel that enables the customer uh, to kind of get what they want. So that's the way we kind of look at it, less from the Amazon perspective, more from the customer perspective, giving them the experiences they want wherever they are. Um, and as these things take off and the adoption increases and customers start using it, this becomes an additional touch point uh, for kind of Amazon as well as other businesses, but also for the customer to get what they want kind of faster uh, and in better ways. Gary, what do you think about um, the idea that apps are finished because we're all going to be using rich messaging? <laughs> we'll, we'll see if the, uh, if the carriers have the leadership to, to, to make that happen. But yeah. what is interesting, you know, we, there's, there's three real disruptions that we're talking about here. You were masterful to, to bring together uh, identity, commerce, and, um, and RCS. Mm -hmm. And what's unique about, all, about those three things is it really is a balkanized space, right? Nobody really owns that today. And it's true opportunity for the carrier to show the leadership and to provide you know, that, the consistency and common platform. Obviously with RCS, there's some network effects that, of existing uh, legacy solutions that they're gonna have to come up against, but you know, this, is, this is about moving forward and, and becoming more modern in their, in their business models. And so I think it's a very exciting time. Uh, verdict is out, um, but at least there's a, there's a path of success here. What, what do you feel about um, operators as content providers? This is like, Ten years ago, they all tried it, um, and the, you know, there's signs that some of them are trying to get back directly into the content game rather than through partnerships or whatever. It really is a very expensive business proposition to be in the content space, but content uh, has proven to be a successful model. Um, you know, obviously, in the Uni United States, AT&T's made some big bets in, in content, and they consider themselves a content company first and a mobile carrier second. You know, they're pretty unique, but you know, behind them, you have Telefonica, Tim, and others that are making some big bets. In, in content, and uh, you know, it, it is definitely one path, and it's been proven uh, to be successful. Not all carriers will have are sufficiently capitalized uh, to do that, but I think you know, there's there's many other opportunities of being able to monetize their subscribers other than this content. And uh, you know, speaking of of, of RCS, um, one of the things that you can do is integrate payments into there. Damien, I don't know, it, where, what's the latest on integrating? carrier billing into rich messages? I think, I think it's uh, still in its nascent time, days, uh, but it's actually, I think, something that's quite, quite exciting um, moving forwards. And I think you know, the, uh, the examples that Pierre uh, has been using in terms of, I, I, I'm guessing kind of the early kind of um, uh, prototypes will be in parking. You know, it, it's about understanding um, the consumer uh, need and convenience, and, and I think the parking model um, lends itself to that, um, especially with the you know the PSD2 
new rules, regulations um, that have come in on carrier billing, um, enabling you know us to be able to do these things. So I think from that perspective, I think we're going to see you know more of these um, these models starting with parking and ticketing um, from an RCS perspective. Uh, but I think it's going to gradually spread from there um, uh, as we as we move, move forwards. Have you done any experiments as a company in? Um, we have got a couple of things going on which I can't really talk about at the moment, but I know, I know you guys have, have done some stuff in, in different countries. Um, speaking with, uh, with James recently, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things going on. I think there's, yeah, I mean, there's stuff going on, let's put it that way. Yeah. Pierre-Francois, do you want to talk about integrating payment into messaging? Just one comment. Uh, every Saturday morning, uh, I go to the, the marketplace, uh, to the a real market, <laughs> to buy my fruit. He's uh, French, yeah. so <laughs> buying a baguette. No, the old way. And uh, I have to park, to park my car, and uh, there are people queuing in front of a kind of uh, a parking machine, and it's uh, really boring. Uh, it's really complex. You need to enter your uh, license plate and so on. And, uh, um, and I think that to turn this experience into uh, a, chatbot, a chatbot service, uh, you don't need to download an app. You will enjoy carrier bidding at the end of the day. Uh, makes it a very different uh, experience because uh, even w when it's raining, you can do it uh, within your car. You don't need to go to the to, to, to the machine and queue in line. Um, and I think that's a, a kind of nice disruption where operators can play a role with uh, with other uh, with other partners such as. Uh, aggregators, integrators, uh, because uh, all this, at the end of the day, is uh, software. You need to integrate it into uh, uh, a new machine that the police uh, will have in their hand to, to check that the license plate. Uh, and uh, moreover, I will be happy because if after two hours uh, I'm not able to go back to my car and say, uh, and go again in front of the machine to enter my plate again and so on and so forth, I can do it from uh, 500 yeah. meters away and uh, update my uh, my ticket. And that's uh, not my ticket. <laughs> and when, when, when would something like that be rolled out commercially, do you think? I, I think the, uh, uh, well, it depends. Either you believe that uh, the system will take off when uh, all carriers in a given country will, uh, will launch the service, uh, in any case, I think that uh, Google will help <laughs> launching the service by uh, launching it uh, OTT with or without the operators. I mean, the investment that they've made is so huge that the one way or the other, they have to, uh, uh, well, to, to take the chance. So uh, uh, with or without the operators, I think that uh, we'll be there somewhere by the end of this year in uh, most European markets. And uh, then it's only uh, well, uh, a few steps forward uh, because uh, the, uh, the rich business messaging environment and the way we can uh, develop bots on top of that is ready. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool and uh, we've seen many demos, so uh, I'm pretty optimistic on that. Um, okay, we've got a couple more minutes. Is that, have you got any questions from the audience on future business models? Okay, um, Amir, I'm just going to come back to you. There's one more, um, one more idea that came up um, that Amazon was supporting, which is sort of the idea of paying per engagement. Um, so it's a different kind of currency. It's like an attention as a currency. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, for sure. Um, so typically... Hello. All right. So uh, typically when you look at uh, ad models and uh, when their businesses or marketers want to go out and they acquire or engage customers, the typical model is CPM model, kind of cost per thousand impressions, uh, or relatively more recently, CPI model, cost per install, when you're kind of, you pay when someone installs the app. Really taking that concept to the next level and only paying per engagement uh, from, an, uh, from a kind of the company that's advertising. Um, and the, examples kind of, of this area is, let's say you want to bring in a new customer to use your app or your kind of, uh, bot on a conversational uh, platform or so on. Uh, in, in addition to just being able to go out there, put video ads and so on, you're able to go a bit deeper and say, 
I'm only gonna pay when a customer comes into my experience, let's say it's a game, comes into my game experience and reaches level 12 and builds a castle uh, when they're playing a game. It's kind of really specific and deep uh, inside of the app or kind of the, the content experience. And uh, that helps kind of in two ways from a business kind of perspective that's advertisers, they really only pay when they get what they want, when they get that high value action that matters. And usually that's also tied to a monetary value because a game knows when you reach level 12 and build a castle, you're likely to spend you know, $30 or so in the game. And each company kind of knows their own actions and what they drive. If it's a subscription, you know that if someone stays subscribed for a couple of months, they're likely to stay subscribed kind of moving forward. If someone sends a thousand you know, messages, they're likely to continue to use the, um, the app that they're kind of using in, to, to conversate, right? Uh, so once you know these specific actions and drive them, it really changes the model and creates this new way to advertise but also monetize your content while at the end of the day, again, kind of going back to the theme of delighting the customers. And Gary, I know that you, you've done quite a lot of work in the gaming space as well in terms of, in terms of um, engagement and upselling yep. and so on. Yep. Maybe you can tell us about that. I, I agree 100% with Amir that I think moving forward, the real model around mobile advertising is about engagement and, and demographic targeting. Um, I think with sponsor data as an example, we've worked with many game companies around the world where it is just that. Companies are paying for people to play rewarding them for certain levels, and we have all the metrics to show the huge efficiencies for customer acquisition and monetization with these sort of models compared to standard CPI and, and CPA. So um, we, we believe that is the, the model moving forward. Great, okay, well, it's a more complex market, but it's many more opportunities as a result. So thank you very much for sharing your opinions today, Gary, Amir, Jack, Pierre-Francois, and Damien. Um, Join us, I think, for drinks. I think uh, Dario is going to come back and um, tell you where you can get them. But thanks very much for listening, and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.